Hey guys, you're listening to the Anderson Business Advisors podcast. Uh, today I'm joined by T Chad Ketcher. Did I say that right? Yeah, that'll work. Absolutely. Well, anything a little late for supper. <laughs> so, uh, I've known Chad for a number of years, and Chad has a very interesting company that we're going to talk about. And more importantly, we're going to talk about creating legacies, how you do it, what type of things you can do. I, can, I mean, I can talk on the legal side all day long. End of the day, there's a lot of human things you can do that has a pretty dramatic impact on what type of legacy you leave. So uh, really happy to have you with us, Chad, Thank first you. off. Good to be here. And uh, I'm just going to start off real easy uh, with the a little bit of background about you. Where did you grow up and why did you get into what you do? All right. I, um, I grew up in a little town in Minnesota, went to all 12, 13 grades in the same school, knew the same people, uh, decided I needed to get out of there. And uh, Where were you in Minnesota? A uh, little town, a little college town south of Minneapolis called Northfield. So for all my Northfield friends, I didn't go to St. Olaf or to Carleton. I, uh, I went out of state to go to school, looking for some direction in my life, looking for some purpose. And uh, the funny thing is, I found it in bits and pieces kind of along the way. Uh, I stumbled into radio. I, uh, you know, and of course, radio, you, nobody, nobody makes a living in radio unless they're in sales. And so now, you know, I had, I had a family to raise and uh, trying to make ends meet like that didn't work. And I, I found a, an ad in the paper for a, a public uh, publishing company that needed the writer. Mm -hmm. well, you know, I had an English degree. I, I, and as it turned out, they were writing sales training, the sales management training for pharmaceutical companies, like Fortune 100 companies, like the top of the top of the top. Mm -hmm. So I did that, did that for a few years, made some connections, learned some things, uh, picked up some skills along the way. Um, ended up in the ministry for a while uh, as the media director of a, of a large church. And they said, hey, do you know anything about video? And I said, I will by the next time we talk. Ah. And, so, and this is all in the days before YouTube. So I taught myself, I, I found an, an ad online for a company that did video training via DVD. They sent me a DVD and showed me how to set up cameras and how to how to edit footage and, and things like that. What I had already done a little edio, audio editing uh, in radio, so adding video to it was just kind of a natural next step. Um, and all along the way, I found that I kept getting drawn to into conversations with seniors. I had great, I had terrific grandparents growing up, I had great relationships with them, and I found that they were just the most fascinating, interesting people with great mm -hmm. stories and a lot of wisdom. And um, so while I was at the church and I was doing media, the youth pastor approached me. He wanted to build a bridge between his high school students and the seniors. And when I mean seniors, I, I mean people who are over 60, over 70, over 80. He's trying to make that, that connection there. And he said, would you interview some of the couples that are in their 60s and 70s, find out how they dated, how they, what they did with, for fun when they were teenagers, and let's show the, our current teenagers what it was like to be a teenager in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Wow. And so I, I did all that. And my wife said to me, you know, there's a business in that, don't you? And I went, oh, who's going to pay for this? This is not a... But there was. And I did a little research on it, and I found that there were a lot of people that do it. Uh, there were a lot of people who, you know, maybe came from broadcast television and had some cameras in their basement that they weren't using or... They worked with seniors and just had a love for, for our elderly and for the stories that they tell. And so I started making the connection. I started meeting, uh, talking with seniors and saying, hey, tell me about what that was like. Well, then you put a camera in front of them and mm -hmm. magic happens. You get to find out some really, really interesting. I mean, some of these people, your grandparents, before you came along, were interesting people. Your mm -hmm. parents were cool before you came along. That's what I had to learn. Um, you know, they had interesting lives. They did cool things. And some people think, well, you know, my grandparents didn't discover penicillin. They didn't storm the beaches of Normandy. They didn't win a World Series with a, you know, with a home run. What did my grandparents do? What did my parents do? Mm -hmm. Well, when, it doesn't sound like much, but when you raised four kids on a farm out in the fields of western Minnesota, You'd be surprised at how interesting that is, the depth of character, the, the personal skills, the things that you learn from that kind of a life. It's a lot more interesting than you think it is. In our entertainment-saturated world, 
expects everything to be fireworks and explosions and 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 high production and 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 mm -hmm. everybody's a superhero everybody's tony stark no those it's stories interesting. Are, it's, it's interesting, interesting that you say that because uh my family my mom's side is from minnesota st cloud oh, sure. and uh great grandfather came over from sweden mm -hmm. where he was a goose herder became a tailor and lived in minnesota and wisconsin for uh till the end of his life Mm -hmm. uh, my great grandma was Norwegian it, and the only reason I know this is because they wrote everything down and we ended up getting one of the family albums that, that had the history and there was actually letters in there when the kids had I think I think he had uh, everybody had the mumps and they were quarantined oh sure and so he could see them but he could only visit them through the window so oh, he'd sure. write them letters and things like that and they ended up with those that's sweet on my dad's side of the family we don't have any of that Right. So we don't have that history. It's, it's kind of interesting, just to put a quick comparison uh, about how poignant that is and how it does create and gives the story. So I actually know a lot of more, more about my mom's side of the family uh, as a result and hunting and how, how they fed themselves and everything else. It was like yeah, you, you, the old adage, uh, you eat what you kill. <laughs> that was very real back then. Well, I'll um, tell you the truth. You know, I'm, I'm almost 50 and I just discovered some things. My dad kept us at arm's length from his extended family for my whole life. And mm. I've just recently gotten to know his older brother, my uncle, who now has custody of him because he's got dementia and everything. And I just sat down with him and they showed me a whole genealogy of my family all the way back to Germany that I had no idea about. Jeez that, Louise. Yeah, things that, that I discovered. There was a pastor, you know, that came over from Germany. There, you know, they had some of them were successful business owners and had textiles and raised mm -hmm. all kinds of, and some of them were just straight up alcoholics. <laughs> it, you didn't know any of these things, and so this discovery of where we came from, you and I now have this this other understanding, and because yep. I only have one side of my family that I knew anything about, my history just just like you did and the other side was just this this kind of cloud of mystery i tell so, a story my mom's dad my grandfather died in 2006 mm -hmm. and at the time he had four great grandchildren they were all happened to be my children and since then all of my cousins i was early bloomer uh all of my cousins now have had children so mm -hmm. there's 24 great grandchildren 20 of whom he never got to meet and never got to meet him, and I'll tell you this something. If I were to tell you one of my grandpa's jokes, you would not laugh. But if grandpa told you one of his jokes, you would fall out of that chair because it was in the delivery. It was in yeah. the presentation. You just knew he could set up a punchline that even if it wasn't really all that funny, his setup made all the difference and nobody will ever get to see that again mm -hmm. and that to me was that was a clarion call that was a wake up that was a you got to get this done because every day a million people write the last chapter of their story and close the book and nobody ever reads it mm -hmm. and we lose all of that those personal dynamics the the facial expressions the eye roll when dad tells a story and mom rolls her eyes like oh, that's not how that was we lose all of that if we mm -hmm. don't it's kind of a that's kind of an interesting thought so a lot of people you know that you think of what we know about uh, ancient cultures and things like that and it's and it's only in what's actually left behind and what they intend to leave behind that's right uh nowadays we live in a in a in a, in a day and time where there, that doesn't need to happen and i guess that's why i'm interested in what you do uh it's because you're able to, to be very deliberate about what you're going to capture and what you're going to pass on sometimes you get photo albums and if you're like me, I, I'm not a big picture taker. Every time my wife pulls out and camera or wants to do selfies and things like that, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, it's not my favorite thing in the whole world. And that's not being really deliberate about it, but doing videos and things like that where you're actually telling a story, do that all day, that's a lot more fun. But you're actually communicating to future generations. So, so tell me a little bit about, so listeners, so they know, give them an idea of what you do for a living, and uh, what your company does. And I would love to hear some of the stories about what you guys do too. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Generation Bridge Media exists to capture people's life stories on video. And that's, that's really the point. You can, 
you can write down your story, and a lot of people do. A lot of, I actually teach a course on how to capture your memoirs. In writing, I made up a series of worksheets that tap into the different parts of the memory, that approach memories from different angles, mm -hmm. and you can write that down, and that's great. You I, can, can I stop you real quick? Because I actually think that's really cool. That's like a year long thing. It's sending out, that's the, it sends out, you, you, you question them every single day. It's something that they can answer in an email, right? To create it's every more. Right. I send them a, an email a week and this is still in development. We're still developing this, but it's, um, they get an email every week. Tell me about your favorite teacher. Tell me about what was the classroom like that you, you know, grade school, what was an activity you did in middle school? Tell me about a vacation that you took with your family. So we'll go back to specific memory points. Over 52 weeks, you can cover a lot of ground. And you can answer, you know, if you, you can type it in. You can answer as much or as little about it, give as much or as little detail as you want. And then we compile all that. And at the end of 52 weeks, you'll get a, a, either a PDF or a hardbound coffee table style book with all of these stories that you've written from your perspective. See, I think, I think stuff like that's cool because I'm, I'm, I'm a writer and, and if you don't write every day, it doesn't get done. Like if you said, hey, I'm gonna sit down and this week I'm gonna write my book. <laughs> yeah. Good luck, right? I'm sorry, I've done that stuff and you can right. lock yourself into a room and that's when you forget what to write. But if yeah. you're doing it every day, daily, it's, it's amazing of what you actually can create. So I, I, t I tend to gravitate towards that, but. I didn't want to get you sidetracked. A lot of this is about the spoken word in the video. So, so that's one thing you do, but what, what's the meat of, uh, of what your company does? Well, it's, it's an interesting thing that you bring up with that, and I'm glad that you, you, you called attention to that. Um, the original document that I put together was a memory planning toolkit, and it's just a series of worksheets. But each worksheet, and I hate the word worksheet because people think it's work, but it's actually the memory prompts that mm -hmm. come at it from different angles. And different, because different people remember things. Some people need an organized monthly, daily calendar list. They said, well, this is what I was doing in 1967. In mm -hmm. fact, April, May, June, July, August. They think like that. They think in lines like that. Other people, they, okay, find a picture. Tell me who's in the picture. Tell me what was happening that day. And then they, they remember things in pictures and they remember stories. And then they start talking about, well, Uncle Fred is in this picture. Oh, I got to tell you about Uncle Fred. He was a character and you start getting off into that sort of thing. So it approaches it in different elements. Well, I taught this, I presented the, the, the toolkit and taught a class on it at the local library. And Andy came up to me afterwards. Andy was 82 years old. He had been a teacher. He had been a school board administrator. He had done, been in education his whole life. And he, now as he was getting into his 80s, he came up to me afterwards holding the toolkit in his hands and he, with tears in his eyes. He said, I have been trying to write down my memoirs for years because I felt like I had a story to tell, but I never knew where to start. I never felt like I had a track to run on. And he held it out and he said, now I have a track to run on. Now I've got something to guide me through the process of organizing my memories. Because if I were to sit you down in front of a camera and say, tell me what you did. Tell me your life story. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Ah, uh, nobody's going to remember. And, and then what they do is they get into 1973 and they say, oh, in order to understand what Harvey did in 1973, you kind of have to know a little bit about his background. But now I've got to go back to 1957. Now I'm out of order. Don't worry about it. Let's just capture stories in groups. Because what ends up happening is to tell the, the wedding story from 1949, you have to know something about the people that were there. So let's, let's instead of telling story as a line, let's start, it's, it's almost like a, a scatter plot, like you would do with brainstorming. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the wedding. Well, that's this story and this story and this story and this story. And, and these people were there. And what's interesting about them is, well, now you get a whole lot of family dynamics, mm -hmm. even family politics, but you get the, the personalities that are there. And you, for, for example, Laverne, I was, Laverne was 85 when I interviewed her. She got married in June of 1949 in the fields of Western Minnesota, okay? It was the hottest June on record, but she was the eighth of nine children. And her mom had kind of gotten tired of making wedding cakes. So she decided this time we're having ice cream. Ice cream. Hottest day of the year. 
refrigeration, even electricity in houses was not a common thing uh, in Western Minnesota in 1949. Oh, man. The refrigeration thing. So by the time the wedding was over, the ice cream was all down the table. It was, you know, something about, you know, I, I think she even got some on her dress. Well, at the time, you've heard of bridezillas. And you know, you know, when, when the, the wedding isn't perfect, people can, okay, we were a little more laid back back then, but even now, even 40, 50, 60 years later, to look back on that story, you can't help but laugh. You just know from the setup what's going to happen. And the way Laverne told it was absolutely priceless because she's so deadpan and so calm about the whole thing. She said, that ice cream is everywhere. You know, and so, and at that moment, that's fun. Those are classic moments. That's what lives are built on, is those funny moments. And that's why we can capture that. And what I was saying earlier, you know, you can capture it on paper. And that's great. And that's really cool. And there's a lot of people uh, that will take an audio cassette recorder. It's a big deal back when, you know, you remember cassettes, you know, they're about this size. And, oh, yeah. Uh, pop in the cassette into the player and hit record and say, Grandma, tell me the story. And if grandma was you know, a good storyteller, then you can get some good stuff, and that's audio. And where do they go? They go in a cardboard box, in a cardboard box, in a cardboard box that sits in the closet down under the stairway, and that's where they stay forever. And the other thing about audio is you don't get the facial expressions. You don't get the eyes and the, the lean in, and, you know, like Gordy leaned in and he said, and the beer that day was off. You know, you, you don't get that stuff on an audio tape. That's why for me, videotape, capturing these things on video captures all of the nonverbal. 93% of our communication is nonverbal. So it's not mm -hmm. even in the words, it's in the, the hand gestures, the, the look, if you've got two people together and grandpa's remembering the story one way and grandma goes, oh, Marlon, that is not how that went. Mm -hmm. Miss all of that. So that's why to me, video is just, a, it's the way to, and plus you can put it up on YouTube and Vimeo and all of these other sources, you can have it available forever. So Chad, what you guys do is you create memory prompts and recordings of people. Do you, is this nationwide or is this something where you do it over, uh, online? How are, how, what's the way that you actually do this? Well, the vision is for it to be nationwide. Yeah, absolutely. But it really needs to be person to person. You have mm -hmm. to be able to, yeah, you have to make some sort of a connection between the interviewer and the interviewee. So I do them in person. Right now it's just me and a camera. And I will go, you know, have camera, we'll travel. Have um, camera, we'll travel. Right, so. But what we're so, doing here right now, we're in two different states. You're, where are you at right now, Texas? So there's, that's why we came up with two different packages. There's one mm -hmm. where I will actually bring cameras and microphones and lights and the whole professional gear rig and an assistant and we will come out to your house and we will sit down and we'll interview family members and we'll spend a day on site in your home or wherever you want to be and so yeah with a plane ticket we're nationwide but the other one like you mentioned we came up with a package that we can just do over zoom and i can look at you and you can look at me and we can get those stories on video that way there's really yeah. no reason not to do it nowadays like i look at it and i think about my own you know i have a daughter and Mm -hmm. I always, uh, you know, we, we, we chat a lot, but there's, there's still some things that it, when, if she has uh, children, I'm assuming that she will, if I have more children, um, you're still looking at what, what's, the, what's the future going to look like and what would you want to say to somebody? What would you want them to know about you? Now, me personally, I'm on video all the time. So like they could, they could see a professional side of me, but a personal side, no way. I'd actually have to be very deliberate about creating it. You have to be intentional about sitting down and talking about your personal values and your stories because, and, and honestly, there are things that, in, that, that grandparents will say to my face that they can't necessarily say, they don't feel comfortable saying to their kids or their grandkids. It just, it's not the same. All those personal dynamics are in the way. So sometimes it's helpful to have an objective kind of third party, even yeah. though we're capturing it on video, there's things mm -hmm. that you feel more free to share when you feel safe with the person across from you. I look at it uh, like I, I, I've had this where somebody says, hey, what do you, you know, he, he, I'll use my daughter as the example. Uh, my wife and I will be somewhere and somebody asks me a question. And if my daughter's present and I answer and you just see her beam and, and she's so happy because it's not something that like maybe we would just sit there and say, hey, by the way, we're so proud or hey, you did this great accomplishment or whatever. 
but it's sometimes it's just they're hearing you tell the story that's involving them. Uh, and it adds a different dimension. I think I, I would uh, mirror what you're saying is quite often we're not really good at expressing ourselves directly to the ones we care about or the future generations as well. We just ignore it uh, when there's so much that you could actually give. And you said something, uh, I used a word that's really important to me, which is values. And uh, a shared value system is what makes a family great, what makes a country great and all these things. It's these things that we share how do they even know what your values are? How do they even know about their, uh, who came before us? I mean, I would love to have this for my great grandparents, my grandparents I got to spend some time with, but not enough. And uh, I would love to know more. I, I still get bits and pieces from like an uncle who will talk about my grandfather skating out on a family party and going down to the local pub where he gets to talk, like you said, he would sit and talk to anybody and everybody in that bar and he would kind of go hide. I never knew anything like that, uh, you know, sounds weird, but in a way uh, like that causes more affinity because I knew who he was uh, mm -hmm. from my lens, but I never looked at it through other people's lens. And frankly, I, I never got to hear it from his lens, right. but it had just been so interesting. That would have been really cool. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, that opportunity is missed. We all have an opportunity to capture it. And uh, it seems ridiculous not to, I don't know. Well, What's the most interesting one you've done? Oh, go ahead. My my grandmother is a bridge back to her grandmother. Mm -hmm. never, she was gone long before my mother was born. So there was no way to have that connection. And when we talk about values, you know, values isn't necessarily something that we sit around the dinner table and talk about. Maybe we, should. If we have to be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. And something about putting a camera in front of you and thinking about your legacy you know, one of the questions I always ask is, what are the, what are the core sort of life values, life messages, because people call it different things, that you would want your grandchildren and great-grandchildren great to take for themselves and emulate in their own lives? And some people are just like, eh, you know, work hard, do the best job you can, make as much money and get out. But there are some people who are very, in, very specific about it, you know, Laverne in particular was like, I would want my children to love reading. I would want my children and grandchildren to love God and their fellow man and be good citizens and, and, and make a name for themselves, but, but to serve the people around them and to be a part of the community. Well, that's not something you necessarily talk about at the dinner table. And while it should be, it's, it's not unless somebody asks. And then, so I ask. And I ask where we can have it on video and they can share it with the family. Another thing that parents will do at that time is tell me, I'll say, tell me about what, do you, what are you most proud of in your own life? And they'll tell me about career things or their kids that they raised. But tell me what you're most proud of with your kids and grandkids. And I'll tell you what, there is something about the blessing of a father and the blessing of a mother that when they say, you know what, I'm really proud of the way Anne has just, she married a good man and she raised a good family and look at her kids. I'm so proud of, or I'm so proud of the business this one put together, or I'm so proud of what he did with his, you know, how he's living out his dream, or there's something about telling your kids and grandkids that you're proud of them and not just, yeah, I'm proud of you, but specifically identifying why mm -hmm. and, and capturing, because that communicates your values, what you're proud of, um, just as much as just saying, I want you to be a community citizen to say, I'm so proud of the fact that you got involved in your church or your community and you, you led a Boy Scout troop or you got involved in the city council or whatever that was, something that you're proud of that communicates values and say, well, you know, I guess we're the kind of people that get involved and do things and you carry that then out. You know, it's interesting. So I, I, I do a lot of estate plans and I've never heard anybody say, I'm so proud of somebody, boy, they're rich. No. <laughs> and like, but how are we trying to like, like, what are we doing to try to, you know, cause them to think how great we are? You always right. think of like, you know, what do you want your parents to think of you? Quite often, a lot of people focus in on the money instead yeah. of on the uh, actual value they're adding back into society. What's the most interesting conversation you've had uh, or even one or two? Where, uh, where somebody and you're capturing something and you're going, holy schmoly, there's no way their family knew about this or this is one I'll of those moments. I'll tell you one in particular. I'll tell you about Gordy. 
when, um, back in 1956, Gordy was 17 years old. He was six foot four, 200 pounds, a four sport athlete, movie star good looks, and a wicked fastball. And he got drafted out of high school by the Baltimore Orioles. All right, they flew him to Chicago to meet his agent. It was the first time he'd ever been outside of his little town in Minnesota. Okay, mm -hmm. first time on an airplane. Here's this backwater kid from the Midwest playing in the big leagues. Okay, and he worked up through double, triple A and double A and single A. He worked up through and he got start. His first start was at Tiger Field. Detroit in uh, 1950, end of 1957, it would have been. He had a negative one ERA. Uh, you know, it, was, it ended up not being a great game from him. He didn't, he didn't finish, but he played in the majors. It was the only time he ever played in the majors because later that season he hurt his elbow. Hurt your elbow, not a big deal anymore, but in 1957, that was it. They would send you back to double A AA or triple A to figure out, you know, and to, to, to kind of work it back out. So, he, you know, he went back and, and he drifted down to double A and he drifted down to single A. Spring of 1960, they, they let him go. Well, now he has a family. He had married his girlfriend, they had a baby girl. Uh, in fact, he tells a funny story about how he found out about his baby girl. He was up to bat, or no, he was in the dugout in um, Vancouver with the double A team. And the announcer over the loudspeaker says, congratulations to Gordy Sundin. His wife had a baby girl this morning. Well, that's how he found out about it. So he runs back with his cleats still on, running sparks down the, the concessions line to get up to the press box so we can call the hospital and talk to his wife and find out about all this. Mm -hmm. Well, he got out of baseball and he took his earnings and he and a couple of buddies bought a bar in Minneapolis. And... As he tells it, he drank up all the profits. He doesn't remember the 60s. In the late 70s, now with three girls at home, he and his wife, he sobered up. She went through treatment with him, and, and he got his life right. He got a good job in sales with the Campbell Soup Company, and he retired well. He did great for himself. He bought a home in Southwest Florida, Naples, just beautiful. And he made a good life for himself. Well, when I met him, he was in a wheelchair. He was terminally ill with liver disease. He had who knows how long left to live. So we turned on the camera. I got some lights and a microphone and a camera and we sat down at his, at his place and he told me about a time, you know, the, the time he and his wife went up to the Boundary Waters in Northern Minnesota and just the two of them went out camping and a bear attacked their camp. And he went sprinting for his boat, buck naked, he picked up a six pack of beer and ran to the boat, left his wife in the tent. So you, you can imagine the dynamics that are going on now. Oh man. But the way he tells it, you, see, you had to be there. Um, and so he gets done, he laughed, he cried, but it was pretty clear after a couple hours, he was fatigued, his, you know, he was, mm -hmm. he had all he had. So I reached up and I pushed stop on the video recorder and he leaned into me and he looked me dead in the eye and he said, young man, I just told you some things that I've never told anybody. Well, you know, when you get a confession like that, mm -hmm. I, you know, I knew he had a short time left to live. So I got all that, you know, I got the footage together and I cut it down and, and they sent me some pictures and I worked pictures into the story so you could see Gordy's face wow. over here and it appears. Got all those together and I knew time was running out. So I sent them, I put it on YouTube and sent them the link and they gathered the whole family, the three daughters, the son-in-laws, all the grandchildren. And there's Gordy sitting in his wheelchair, little Marianne, his wife sitting by his side, all the kids and grandkids. And they watched the video and they laughed and they cried and they looked at him and said, I didn't know you did that. Mm -hmm. And three days later, he moved to heaven. Wow. That's got to be pretty. I'll tell you the truth about that. There was something that I learned in that moment. He got some things off of his chest. He got mm -hmm. to say some things to his kids and grandkids that he just, he a big tough guy. He was an athlete. He was a man's man. You don't say all the emotional things, the soft, puffy things to your kids, right? Especially to the boys. That was hard for his generation. And he got to say those because he felt safe saying them to the camera. 
And they got to hear those things from him and they will always have them in his language, with his verbal, you know, his mannerisms and all that. They have that now forever. But it taught me that I didn't just have a business. In a way I had a ministry. I had a way for him to get some things said. It was like his personal manifesto. This is what my life amounts to. This is who I was. This is the mark I left on the world. This is what I'm leaving for my kids and grandkids. So it's, it stopped being just a business at that point. It became a way for, for people to talk to each other and for people to share some things that are deep and meaningful to them with the people that they care about. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty, uh, it's pretty intense too. imagine it's good. It's not something that you just go and throw something up and, and do. It's something that you're called to do more so. Yeah. And in, and in interviewing people to be interviewers, mm-hmm. it's not just, I can't just take anybody. I can't just take the cameraman and sit him in the chair to ask questions. I've got okay. three pages of interview questions and I could ask any one of them. They're in no particular order. Because I might get into a story about the wedding day and find out a story about his career or her career or something about the kids that comes up. And now I want to pursue that trail because there's something rich there. And I've uncovered something. I've uncovered a diamond that's going to be important to this family story. And that's not just something you have to be trained to do that. That's not just something you instinctively know how to do. Mm-hmm. You have to kind of know how to go a little bit deeper into the stories. And I can just ask you questions off a list and there would be no kind of heart to heart connection. It takes something more than that. That's pretty cool. I really think that's uh, not something anybody's really thinking about. Again, I, I work in the world of estate planning where people start thinking immediately of when I say estate planning, they think of death. And I always look and say, you know, it's creating a legacy the way to create a legacy is to establish your values and pass them down in some fashion. But we completely ignore the, uh, the fact that we have tools at our disposal nowadays and uh, that we could actually imprint the, the, the values to somebody else. Uh, even as times change, even as times change, you could do it. So, uh, so that's pretty cool what you do. So you actually go out and you do the interviews, you have different, uh, uh, different, I guess it sounds like different services for different people, you know, depending on how in depth they want to go from the side of creating things in writing to creating videos uh, online to actually doing a production and coming into their homes. It sounds like that's kind of what the, the gist is. How does somebody get a hold of you if they want to learn more, Jen? Well, you know, the standard answer is to say, well, you go to generationbridgemedia.com and that's my mm-hmm. website. We, we can post a- that too. We'll post that up so people can Thank see you. it. We have a YouTube channel. We have a Facebook page. We have a Twitter account. Uh, I've got my misgivings about Twitter, but I set up the page on the way. Um, And so uh, it's a safe place on Twitter. We only talk about good stories. Um, Mm -hmm. But so those, so YouTube and Facebook are really the, the, the primary ways, but there's something unique that we've set up just for Anderson clients, just for your, your friends that, that you've sent to me, Toby. And that is, we have a page on Generation Bridge Media, and we're kind of recultivating this right now, but it's, if you hit generationbridgemedia.com slash Anderson, um, that's gonna be a unique portal for um, my friends that come from, from our friends at Anderson. Okay, perfect. Well, we believe in it. We believe that when you create a legacy, it's about actually establishing your values. Uh, again, you can do it through the uh, estate planning process. Uh, I love telling stories about some of the really cool things that people have done for their families going forward. Uh, that's going to affect generations. Uh, but there's nothing better. And, I, and I've said this for years. I used to tell parents this when I first started this 20 something years ago. Uh, and I would say, hey, you know what? There's nothing that replaces doing a, a letter to your kids do a video to your kids, do anything you can to let them know that it's okay uh, so that they don't fight. Because where you see people, uh, especially in the, uh, when, when somebody's no longer with us is there's an indecision and there's anxiety and there's concern and it could be over the littlest things like, like, you know, what would, what would have, I remember when my father passed and just picking an urn uh, with my mom and just the, just the the mental beating that she did to herself. Uh, 
of it's not good enough or what would he have wanted and these types of things. And I'm like, I already know what dad would have wanted. Especially you know, if he, dad was a good decision maker. If mom wasn't a great, strong decision maker, now she's got a hundred decisions to make about yep. every little thing. Get that stuff, get that stuff squared away in advance. Uh, and I, I just watched uh, a family just tear itself apart over mom's jewelry. Uh, yeah, you, you, we see that all the time. Yeah. But uh, if mom is actually talking about it and mom is talking about who she is and what she is and it can take those values and then print, it's far less likely anybody's going to do that. In other words, it's almost like dishonoring. When you don't do anything, when you, the worst thing you do is just not say anything. And, uh, and yeah, you're going to watch people just, uh, it's just the anxiety and the indecision and the concern over whether you're doing the right thing. And then you get this fear and greed thing going on and, uh, throw a couple of lawyers at it and you got combustion. Uh, it's so much easier if you just say like, Hey, if, if, if you're, if you're writing it out or if you have videos way better, obviously we have all these cool ways now where we can capture these things. Yeah. do it and uh and and create a legacy that's going to last for hundreds of years and don't look at it as a hey this is going to be something that gets done once like uh, uh gordy who's in the wheelchair uh, i can pretty much guarantee you that that's something that's going to be shared for generations absolutely and so i i just appreciate what you're doing it's not something i do uh yeah. for a living uh but i certainly appreciate what you do for a living and i certainly appreciate you coming on and sharing it uh, with our folks uh, that, that listen to this podcast and watch the video. If, if I could just pop in one more thing. You mentioned about mm -hmm. the anxiety that happens. And yeah. if I was just sitting down to do a video about who gets what of my assets, you can do that with a deposition outline. Mm -hmm. uh, but when people start to think about, well, gosh, what would I want to say to my kids? Then they get all the anxiety. Oh, where do I start? Yep. No. I'll show you where to start. I'll help you. And then you can decide. It's more like putting uh, note cards. Every story, everything that's important to you gets a note card. And then you can, you can put them in order later. And then, you know, if we do a bunch of do it as a series of videos, they may not even watch them in order. There are certain personalities that refuse to watch things in order. So <laughs> put them out there. Later. So, yeah, right? I don't want people to feel anxiety about remembering things in order or, or remembering everything. And as soon as we shut off the camera, every time somebody says, oh, you know, I should have told the story about, okay, now it's on, let's go. <laughs> Tell that story because it's important. If it's important enough for you to come out of your heart, then, then let's capture it. But I don't want people to feel anxiety about the process and about, Absolutely. you know, yeah, you so that's why we give them the tools in advance to call those things back up, to get everything fresh again. I've had people say to me, you know, when you asked me about Mrs. Salisbury, I could smell the carpet in my third grade classroom. It just, when you mentioned, you know, when, when I mentioned that name, I all of a sudden I could remember the little girl sitting at the desk next to me who would pass me notes all the time. I could see you, it, it, it becomes so visceral, it becomes so real to people. And that's what we want to get to. That's why we give you the prompts so that you don't have to try to call it up from a blank sheet of paper. Nobody likes the writer's block. And writer's block is real when you're sitting trying to remember your life. So let's get the prompts to remember the, the important things and those will call up other things and it becomes a fountain. It sounds like you're a very good guide at these things. And you may, have, Thank you. you may have done it a couple of times. Yeah, well, you screw it up enough times, eventually you'll learn what works. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Well, hey, I really appreciate you coming on, Chad. And uh, this is interesting. I, I love hearing the stories. I'm probably more of a story person. So I just love hearing about people's lives. And I just think it's really cool. And that you get to do that with people. It's got to be it's got to be kind of rewarding. You'll never hear anything quite so ribald as a 94 year old woman with no filter tell you how she met her husband. Oh, God. <laughs> I tell you what, you get some details, you get some interesting stuff. And it's I, I have them on my YouTube channel. Check that out. So, hey, I'll and, make sure that uh, we, we put those postings up. So you make sure you send those over and I'll make sure it gets attached to the podcast. Yeah, I find that stuff just, just hilarious uh, and, and amazing. And, you know, uh, nowadays it's so easy to forget the, uh, the our, our elders, which is a growing, growing, they call it the silver tsunami because people are living longer and they, like you have so much to give and, 
we're so busy doing other things and we forget that there's so much rich experience out there. It's like kick them in the butt and say, no, here's, here's a way to bridge that. I actually love that, uh, that, that analogy is, yeah, you're trying to bridge some generations. Yeah. Well, in our jet set culture, our careers take us away from our small town out to Chicago or New York or Austin. And then grandma is still where grandma always was. Yep. And so getting separated from our roots, we lose track of who we are as individuals because part of who I am as, a, as an individual is from my heritage, my little small town, having my grandparents right next door for most of my growing up years. That's different. That's unique. A lot of people don't have any of that. They've grown up. Some of their mm -hmm. relatives, their grandparents are on the other side of the planet. And some of them are just the other side of the country. Some of them are on the other side of town and they never talk. So I'm trying to bridge those so that we learn a little bit more. We used to sit around the campfire and the elders would tell stories of our people. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. We don't even sit around the dinner table like we said anymore. So I'm trying to bridge that gap. I, I think it's awesome. That sounds like an honorable career there, my friend. And Thank I appreciate you. what you're doing. And I, uh, I, I, you know, again, people can reach out to you if they want. And uh, I think you're in good hands with, uh, with Mr. Ketcher. Thanks again, Chad. Toby, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity.